So my name is Imran. I'm one of the partners at Volt Capital alongside Suna, who you saw earlier. Uh, today's panel is going to be on how are allocators allocating into the space. And uh, we have a pretty phenomenal lineup. So I'd, I'd let uh, Jeff kind of start with his uh, bio, and then after that, we can go up to the questions. So Great. Jeff. So briefly, Jeff Buskang from Flybridge Capital, early stage venture fund based in Boston and New York. We do a fair amount of investing in the blockchain space. A couple of our companies here, the Blocks Route team, Uri and Eleni are here doing blockchain scalability layer zero, and Samir Ghosh from Falcon X is also one of our portfolio companies who uh, you just heard from. So anyway, great to be here, and uh, thanks for having me. Great. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, I'm Richard DeLude, one of the co-founders and partners of Underscore VC, a $225 million venture fund based here in Boston. Uh, we are investors in the blockchain space, although it's not um, everything we do. It's about 25% of our portfolio. Uh, we also do a lot of cloud infrastructure investing, uh, and we tend to invest from the earliest stages, so a couple people companies up through Series A and beyond. Um, and we have a couple portfolio companies, I think some you've heard of. Um, Arwin, uh, I was an angel investor in uh, companies like Ripple and Abra uh, and Mercury Bank, so we do a lot of fintech as well. Hello everyone, Aram from Accolade. Uh, we are a fund of funds. We've historically done primarily venture capital, growth equity and direct investments in tech and healthcare. Uh, about two years ago, we started doing more dedicated blockchain fund investments and I would say Today, we feel like there's a critical mass of quality managers that we want to get access to. And instead of doing one-offs, we have launched a dedicated fund of funds in blockchain, $75 million fund of funds that will have around seven to 10 managers and provide diversified exposure across strategies, geographies, types of investments managers will be making and offer that to our LPs. Hi, I'm uh, Brad Cope from Copen from CMT Digital. Uh, I actually head the crypto trading desk, so I manage the day-to-day -day of the spot and derivatives trading, and then I cross over to the venture team for CMT Digital, especially when it uh, comes to our portfolio companies that uh, are involved in the in crypto trading, where the desk is the customer to uh, to that portfolio company. So I'd say in the past four or five years, there's been more attention given to crypto, and so I'd love to learn a little bit more about you know, what is your crypto thesis in your, uh, in your fund and why are you starting to allocate now versus, you know, later? Anyone can start. Yeah, yeah, I can start. So um, we've really been making investments uh, on the venture side since sub September 2017. That was after we started the crypto trading desk. So I think the initial thesis was that we had spent 22 years trading traditional assets uh, in a regulated space, and now we started tra a trading business in Bitcoin, and they didn't look the same. So we, we recognized like sort of what was different, what those gaps were, and, and created an investment thesis around investing in firms that are gonna help uh, you know, fill those gaps and, 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 and improve the, the infrastructure in the space. Um, I would say the catalyst for us was a couple of fold. On the market side, we felt like there was, while still early, there's some traction now around consumer facing applications, financial services, infrastructure. Two years ago, you had Bitcoin, you had the ICO craziness that happened. Today, you have real developer talent coming in. Actually, less money has gone into the space than in 2017, but in far more quality projects. And this year, hopefully, you'll see projects like Filecoin, Definity, Polkadot all launch. We'll see if they're successful or not. But generally, we've seen a lot more traction in the industry. In terms of the actual managers we're targeting, I would say two years ago, you had maybe five to 10 dedicated fund managers in blockchain. Today, we've looked at 60 venture managers, so not actively traded hedge funds, not tokenized funds, not index funds, but actual managers who are dedicated to this and have taken a long-term perspective to the space. I would say if you look at blockchain more broadly, the number of blockchain users today is the same number of internet users in 1994. If you were to put together a portfolio of venture managers back in 1994, and that list wasn't big, ho hopefully you would have picked names like Benchmark 2, Sequoia 5, Kleiner 6, six amongst others. Now, it doesn't mean blockchain managers today are going to generate 1990s venture-like returns, but we think that in our main funds that are venture and growth equity, we can generate around 3x for our LPs. We're hoping to do better on the blockchain side while at the same time protecting against downside by having a diversified portfolio for our LPs. That's great. 
Uh, as a venture manager and investor, uh, we got very excited about this because uh, we're always in pursuit of what are some of the biggest ideas and the biggest markets, and you also follow where is talent going. Uh, and so when we started seeing people literally start playing with the concept of money, th there are very few bigger markets that have ever existed. In fact, it's the market. Uh, and it became programmatic and technology was intersecting money and value and transmission of it. Um, and then also reinventing business models that we've kind of held dear on the internet uh, with entirely new things like crypto incentives. Uh, and so when you see really interesting business models getting created, disruptive technology and great entrepreneurial talent, uh, it got us to, to push all in uh, a fair bit back. Uh, and we've had the good fortune to, to back some great founders and um, you know, continue to do so over the next couple of years. That's great. These are great points. The only thing I'd add in terms of our vantage point at Flybridge is we had a history of investing in two very important themes. One was developer-driven businesses, and the second was communities. So we were the lead investors in MongoDB, which built a very large open source developer-driven community around NoSQL database. We were the lead investors in Firebase and Crashlytics and some other very important developer-driven platforms. And so when we saw this wave of open source-like characteristics and this very strong developer-driven, community-led sets of initiatives around blockchain, we, we got very excited from a pattern recognition standpoint. And that's what led us to begin investing about four or five years ago. Um, I would say, honestly, it's been a slow last two years. So I don't know if Richard would say the same uh, in terms of his investment patterns. But if we look at our portfolio, we were far more active in 2017 and 2018 than we were in 2019, maybe even 2016, 2017, than we were in 2019. And we can talk about why that is. But I think there's some sort of interesting dynamics in the market right now that echo some of what Dave Balter was saying about where are the customers, where are the users, is everybody thinking like a business or are people thinking like a nonprofit side project? Thank you for that. <clears throat> So every time I talk to you know investors outside of crypto, they always bring up the 2017 crypto bubble and they compare it to the dot-com bubble. So I know there are some miscalculations in the past, but what are some trends that you're looking at that's getting you excited in crypto? Yeah, happy to start with that. Yeah. Um, both I'll address the, the bubble, which yeah. I, I very much do think was real. Um, to my experience, I have never seen valuations as distorted as they were in that period. Um, you know, two or three person companies getting, you know, 20, 50 million dollars without any substance beyond a, you know, a paper. And, you know, very often that's kind of divorced from the way we think of it as venture investors of, you know, staging of capital based on proof points, based on revenue to, to David's point earlier. Um, and in many ways, I think that's corrected. Uh, but there's still a little bit of out, out there. Um, I think there continues to be interesting projects being built. And now as time has gone on a little bit more, I think you're starting to see the shakeout of those, of which are the projects that actually had substance underneath them uh, and which are the ones that uh, were really interesting ideological projects but uh, are tougher to translate into, you know, I would call it commercial success. Yeah, I agree with what Richard said on the 2017 trend. I would add... From a consumer-facing application standpoint, you have companies like Sliver.tv that today is a decentralized CDN live streaming network that has more engagement than Twitch when it got acquired by Amazon for a billion. You have companies like Helium that have blanketed fully Austin and New York and are targeting 440 cities in the US. You have things like Brave. You can argue about the token economics of that company, but in terms of the actual user base, it keeps growing. Um, DeFi is another area that's interesting. I think very early days, the Project, the projects and the products generally they are very complex and hard to use, but you have different flavors of peer insurance such as Nexus or lending with Maker or derivatives exchanges. I think it's interesting to see a company like Zerion, which is sort of the Expedia of DeFi saying, well, let's take all these different solutions, simplify them and create a UI where the actual customer can use them. So I think we're seeing that too. On the infrastructure side, you're seeing a lot of traction too. You have Anchorage, which in two years is managing 500 million or more, has a $50 million line with Aon. Uh, you have Figure, which is doing really well from a loan origination standpoint, and by the way, is using blockchain, which has its own native token as well. So I think you're seeing traction on infrastructure, some on the consumer side while it's still early, some in DeFi. 
I think it's still very early days, and hopefully some of these marquee projects this year will launch and be successful. Yeah, I think I would really agree with that user experience part where I think over the last like 12 to maybe 18 months, you've really seen some of the startups sort of focus more on who the end user is and how they're interacting with it. Maybe not leading with the fact that it's a blockchain product, but it's a product that's solving a problem in this way, and really focusing on how people are engaging with it. Um, you know, I think early on, <coughs> blockchain and crypto was sort of built for engineers, like not technologists, for engineers and technologists, and not for like the end user. So as that adoption curve, or people thought the adoption curve was coming, everything was still too hard to use. And as sort of that barrier to use these products goes down, that's when the adoption is going to come, and we're starting to see those problems be worked on. I'll do a quick survey. There's a like a pulse check here. How many of you own cryptocurrencies? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you are parents own cryptocurrencies? Raise your hand. So that's that your parents do not own cryptocurrencies because you fed it to them. They didn't do it on their own. That's right, because you told her to do it. You walked her through Coinbase. I caught you. I see you. It's a big market opportunity. It's a big market opportunity. But this is the point, right? It's like, are your parents, or in Richard's young case, grandparents, going to be using these currencies and for what use? And that's that's where the the mainstream application is going to be. There was a huge amount of speculation in 2017. All of us remember going home over Thanksgiving and being barraged by our family, like, what is Bitcoin, and how do I buy it, and all these Coinbase accounts opened up, and then the market crashed and everybody drifted away. I gave my kids for Hanukkah 2017 $100 worth of cryptocurrency that I told them they could allocate as they like in Coinbase, and to this day they tell me what an idiot investor I am because that's worth now $30, so my kids think I'm like the worst investor on the planet. But anyway, but you know, you get the picture. This for this stuff to be truly embraced in the mainstream, it's going to take a sea change in usability and adoption. So I'd say um, since 2017, we've seen some protocols gain traction, like MakerDAO, Compound, and others. So what are specific like products, or why should we be paying attention to DeFi, out of all of the sectors that are out there? Uh, well, we paid attention to it from the trading desk because it's, it's a pretty small ecosystem. It's pretty, it's easier to dig into that versus sort of all blockchain data if you, if you compare it that way. Um, and we, we definitely have used a lot of those products, one, because, uh, you know, to, to get to know them, it, like get, find the use case, find the use case for the desk, see if there's something there for us to do. And two, like if we hold these assets, you know, we might want to, you know, get it some yield on some USDC if that's possible where, um, you know, it, it's just a dollar. So we, we tested a lot of these things. I think it's interesting to see the number of people that are using it and to, to, to track the rates a little bit just to see how it evolves because that is sort of one of the first use cases that it, it seems to be getting a quite a bit of adoption. Does anybody know the number five, the meaning of the number 5.3 billion in the last like week or two? Plaid. Plaid. It's what Visa did buying Plaid, which was a API platform to make it more efficient to access the data at banks. Five point three billion dollars for this one little company that did this one little thing in this corner of the industry. So when you talk about the inefficiencies in the financial services industry across all categories and all sectors, and think about the value unlock that's going to happen globally if they can reach the unbanked and provide greater efficiency in transaction volume, there's a massive amount of value to be created there. So that's why we're all so excited about the infrastructure for DeFi and the long-term potential. It could take decades to play out, and it's very unclear who the winners are going to be, but it's pretty clear that if you can make financial transactions more efficient, if you can get access, capital access to a broader part of the population and democratize access to capital, it's going to be game-changing from a value standpoint. So we, we talked a little bit about uh, programmatic money. Uh, and what I would say is interesting is one of the very first adoption paths for cryptocurrency was actually remittances. So being able to send something across the sea, get it picked up uh, without Western Union taking a clip of it. 
uh, or you know, not to disparage them, but uh, any, anybody. Um, that's actually very fundamentally primitive innovation. Uh, and the great part is, is it highlights something that I love, which is the permissionless nature of a lot of these protocols, uh, and particularly uh, permissionless, you know, programmatic uh, nature of them. Uh, and what's interesting is, unlike in traditional software businesses where uh, if I'm going to build something around the Google ecosystem, I have to go ask permission from Google to say, can I access the data that sits in your walls? Um, in a lot of these areas, in particular decentralized finance, you can take a protocol and then have somebody access and build around that protocol without the actual inherent permission. So what you see now is if I have Bitcoin and now I can put it someplace to actually get it to earn some interest, right? And these are generally not interest bearing to date. Now that's, you know, potentially I can put it in a place. Then you can do something else with it, like create a synthetic, you know, instrument or something, all permissionlessly, uh, which is kind of interesting. Now you're starting to play with um, value flows that don't necessarily have to go through regulated entities or others, which is scary in some senses, uh, but also exactly one of the biggest opportunities for the, the space. So when I speak to many of the fund managers that are out there, they're always trying to understand like what's the best fund structure to make investments into crypto. Some have decided open-ended funds, some have you know decided closed-ended funds. Uh, so in your eyes, wh what's probably the best, or maybe we could talk about your fund structure and how have you kind of structured a fund to make investments in crypto? Um. I think so there are two flavors. There's the dedicated blockchain funds and then there's the generalist funds and we can talk about those two. But on the dedicated side, I think there is a tendency to cater to the LPs and say we need to do closed end funds because that's what they're used to. And I think both, both closed end and open end can work. It depends really on what you're doing. Um, typically, if managers are targeting more liquid type investments, so token like investments, even SAFs that will be public over the next 18 to 24 months, an open end structure might make more sense. I'll give you two scenarios. Let's say you have a closed end fund. You're on fund three, which means the inve initial investment period on funds one and two have ended. And you have a liquid position, uh, the same liquid asset in all three funds. And let's say that asset becomes really attractive from a price standpoint. You can only deploy capital out of fund three, not the first two funds into that asset. Versus if you had an evergreen structure, you can quickly and very flex in flexible way rebalance that portfolio. Secondly, when I have to close out my fund, the participation, the voting that I had on that network has to end as well. So there's an issue with that if you're doing liquid, liquid investments as well. So I think there's no right answer per se. It really depends on the strategy you're taking versus catering to what LPs are used to. If you're doing mostly equity infrastructure investments, closed end fund made more, more sense. For our fund of funds, we have done a closed end fund. And we've thought about well, what happens at the end of our fund of funds, even if we have open end funds there. Well, one is we can create an SPV and continue that fund of funds. Two is our second blockchain fund can acquire the first blockchain fund, or we can sell the remaining piece in the secondary market. So as long as you've thought about the different scenarios, I think both can work. I only thing to add to that, and I think you hit the nail on the head, is you know build them for the purpose that they're you know actually built. Uh, and I would call this principle kind of duration matching, right? If you're making long ten-year instrument investments, you know, in equity and infrastructure, those kinds of things, then you're probably looking more at a closed end fund. If you're looking at short term hedge fund, crypto arbitrage fund, uh, you're probably looking more at a, a short term type of opportunity. It, to the extent it's useful, just as a, an example, I'll just share a little bit about what we've done yeah. at Flybridge to manifest some of these investment theses and in companies. And it's, it's really pretty flexible based on the situation. So in some cases, we've acquired equity. In some cases, we've acquired tokens. And in other cases, we've acquired equity with a token conversion option, which is the preferred path. Because when you're embarking on these companies, they're all such early stage startups, you have no idea what the business model is going to be. It may be more of an open source token based economic model, it may be more of a revenue driven, equity based economic model. And when you're at the early stage and you don't know, you want to preserve flexibility and you don't want to be rigid because you want to let the entrepreneurs choose whatever is going to be best for them. So we created flexibility in our limited partner agreement with our limited partners to allow us to invest in a range of those options. And that's been pretty productive so far. I think as noted, if some of these things at the end of a fund life 
uh, are lingering. The good thing about this world is that most everything is pretty liquid, mark to market. So you can do something that, you know, you said very quickly, hey, fund two could buy fund one's assets. In the venture capital world, that would be a very complicated, tricky transaction in terms of valuation. In a token world, that's a very straightforward transaction. So I want to switch gears here and talk a bit about the future. <clears throat> Crypto companies, Kanan and Silvergate, both IPO'd recently, I think back in November. And so, like in your terms, what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, companies IPOing? Uh, is like crypto companies ready for you know potentially going to that platform, or do we still have some time before we can get there? Yeah, I have some commentary on this. Um, first is as a venture manager who manages a fund, at the end of the day, you need liquidity, and so I actually think I would not be surprised, given the market environment as it is now, uh, if venture managers are going to try and get some of their companies IPO ready. It's a fantastic market to be taking companies out the door. And I think you have to be you know, prudent and realize that this is probably a great market environment to do that, and it may change. So I think a lot of companies, uh, including some in our own portfolio, uh, are preparing for that and thinking about it. Um, so that, yeah, that's kind of my main perspective. And I, I think you'll see uh, a lot of investor interest in that. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if the Coinbase is the ripples. Some of these bigger companies start to think about it. And I actually don't know how the market will value them, especially ones with assets on balance sheet that are highly volatile. I think it'll be very interesting. I have a slightly different perspective. I think the public markets hate complexity and uncertainty. And crypto companies are enigmas wrapped in complexity surrounded by uncertainty. <laughs> so I think it's going to be really hard to explain business models in a public roadshow where you have 30 minutes in front of unsophisticated investors and a two-week compressed period. I know Ripple has made some public statements about, uh, or there's been some rumors about preparing for IPO, but I, I would be shocked if we saw any mainstream crypto IPOs for quite a while. I would also observe that the private capital markets, even with SoftBank's retreat, the private capital markets are so good that the big companies can access the private markets in huge volume. Hundreds of millions of dollars can be raised on very attractive terms, so why would you go public? It, it, um, it, it creates a burden, and as I said, I think creates, there's a tax from a reporting and governance and uh, explainability standpoint that I don't think any of these companies are really ready for for quite a while. Yeah, I, I, th I think I mostly agree. I think Silvergate was a bit of an outlier because it was a 20-year-old bank and not just like a crypto startup. We have seen other firms go to public markets with like the Canadian venture markets to try to get some liquidity with Voyager and maybe like Galaxy. And I don't, I, I think that, I don't think those have turned out as well as they maybe might have hoped. Uh, so I think it'll be a while before the, the crypto-specific firms that have a completely different business model or completely different business than IPO markets are used to, because IPOs recently have been for much larger firms. Uh, you know, there aren't a lot of small cap or mid caps that IPO anymore. So I, I think that there's a, a long way to go before we're going to see a lot of crypto IPOs. Cool. So we have time for one more question. Um, so we'll just go around and ask, uh, you know, what are some of the companies that you're super excited about and why? Well, I think I'm obligated to list the portfolio <laughs> companies in the room. So I'm going to say... This is the pump uh, our book portion of the <laughs> program. Is that where we are now? Uh, sort of. So uh, f well, flip side, who you guys heard from, uh, Falcon X, Silvergate, Bact. Uh, I think uh, BlockFi is in the room somewhere. Uh, I, I mean, uh, outside of that, I think we're interested for like to see where things like Lightning and where like blockchain and gaming goes as like the new sort of investment thesis that we're working. Could on. you maybe go down one uh, investment that you made and like, <laughs> like why and like like uh, would love to learn more about like usability. Is it like, do you see traction in the space? Is that why? Yeah, like, I mean, the, the easiest story that. for me to tell <coughs> is for Falcon X because yeah. they help us solve a problem on the trading desk, okay. which is where I spend a big chunk of my time. So uh, from the trading desk, we used to connect to multiple OTC desks. We could go out and aggregate a quote from multiple people through Telegram chats or Skype chats, and that's just sort of messy, and then settlement with all those different uh, entities is also messy, where you know, Falcon X and their best execution offering sort of shrunk that universe, where now we only go to them for our off-exchange uh, OTC needs. 
uh, and then there's settlement with one counterparty. Obviously, we're investors, so we know them well. That relationship is good, uh, and, and sort of that best execution was able, allowed us to sort of just operationally reduce our frictions there mm -hmm. uh, from, a, from a price and from a, a settlement standpoint. So that was an easy one for me to get on board with. <laughs> I, can, I can do one. Uh, Helium is a decentralized wireless network where it allows users to buy Helium hotspots for $495. And then the user can use publicly available radio frequencies to connect IoT devices together. The use case can be a vending machine is communicating back to their commercial vendor saying they're out of Pepsi, or you want to connect a bunch of Lime scooters together. Um, that company has targeted 440 cities. They've blanketed a few already and are getting great traction. So it's a company to follow. And the nice thing is the token economics is well built into the system where you buy the hotspot and then you start getting rewarded in Helium tokens. Uh, there's probably three key categories that I, I think of. Um, first and foremost is usability, right? Bringing not the 10,000 people, 10 million people who care about it, but Everybody else, you know, the uh, parents, grandparents, and the unbanked. I, I think those are just categorically very interesting opportunities because we're talking about 10 million people who actually have crypto wallets now, like really, really, uh, and that's just n not many. And I think bringing all of those people on board is, is going to be interesting. Um, very much uh, also think in security, very interesting area. Uh, people talk a lot about custody. You hear custody, custody, custody. Everybody has these solutions. Um, which is great. It actually is even hard as an investor to understand which is uh, the best one. Um, but what's unaddressed is those are assets at rest. I think what's more interesting is assets in motion. And so there's a company called Arwen, um, which is an underscore portfolio company, uh, that addresses all of the time any of your assets are in motion and exposed to risk, which your assets could disappear like this. Uh, and so worry about custody. I worry about assets in motion. So for me, I'll... Um, agree on Falcon X, which is also one of our portfolio companies, and Samir and the two founders were students of mine at HBS, and I'm a huge fan of what they're doing. And then I'll, I'll just do a shout out for Uri and Alani from BlocksRoute. So this is a layer zero blockchain distribution network. It's the Akamai of blockchains. One of the big trade-offs with blockchains is that because they're so decentralized, they're inherently very slow. And when people talk about these DeFi applications, people laugh at the speed of the blockchain networks from a settlement and reconciliation standpoint. So the solution is blocks route, which is speeding up blockchains by propagating blocks more rapidly across the network. They went live a few weeks ago on Ethereum and are speeding up Ethereum by a factor of, am I allowed to say publicly? Mm -hmm. You say. <laughs> yeah, so Ethereum at the speed of light, you think about that, you know, could Ethereum be truly an important transaction platform uh, now with over half the hash power on Ethereum using blocks route to speed up the blocks. It's It's got a, a tremendous transformative potential for the platform and you can imagine that for Bitcoin and some of the other major platforms. All right, well that wraps it up. Thank you so much and we have our final panel. Thank you guys.